Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. So today we have a double feature at 3.30, Jeffrey Grimmett, will be speaking. Uh, now it's James Lee who will tell us about Markov type and the multi-scale multi geometry of metric spaces. How well can Martin Gales aim? <laughs> uh, okay, so thanks for coming. Uh, so the talk today is going to be uh, about a problem kind of at the intersection of probability uh, and the geometry of metric spaces. Let me uh, begin by just giving you a sort of a, a conjecture that, well, the main, which, which is the main object in the talk, or at least a special case of the main thing. So this is a conjecture of, oh, actually, OK, I'll write the conjecture here, but then I won't write below it, just in case this screen, of nor Yuval Paris, then Shrum, and Scott Sheffield from 2004. OK, and the conjecture is? The following. Um, so one has a first of all a planar graph. Uh, it, the graph can be infinite or finite. You'll see that for this particular stating of it doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, you have a planar graph. Um, I'll use d sub g to denote the the path metric, so the shortest path metric on the graph. And then you also have. Uh, a reversible Markov chain uh, whose state space is a subset of the vertices. Okay, so this is some reversible Markov chain uh, on V, and and uh, it's it's uh, it's on a finite it's supported on a finite subset of the vertices. Okay. So this is why that sort of doesn't matter if the graph is finite or infinite. Uh, uh, I'll tell you the quantifiers here in a second. So you have this, uh, this Markov chain. And it's important that this Markov chain is started um, according to the stationary measure. So in fact, this is going to persist throughout the talk. The Markov chain is started at stationarity. And now the question one asks is, what's the average uh, rate of drift of this Markov chain? So you look at the expected distance in the graph. Um, starting at time 0, going to time t, square this, and then compare it to, so on some kind of statement like this, compare it to the distance that the chain goes in one step. Okay. So this is the kind of statement one wants. The expected distance squared after t steps at most a constant times time times the expected distance after one step. Okay. So, so OK, so what's the, I didn't want to, OK, so the point is that C here should be a universal constant, independent of the chain, independent of the graph. Just you know, C should be 10 or 100. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is the conjecture, that there exists such a constant, such that for all planar graphs, for all Markov chains supported on the vertices, start at stationarity, you have, a sort of, uh, you have this kind of drift that you would get, for instance, just from simple random walk on the path, right? on the line. Yes. Doesn't have to be restricted to the edges of the graph. No, no. The, so the Markov chain, the only way the graph comes in is through the path metric in this, in what I've written no, here. So it doesn't have to walk on. Just a general metric, then, if you can. No, no. So the well, the, the metric is certainly given by the edges of the graph. It's the path metric. So you put some weights on the edges, or you don't have to weight them if you don't. But want if to. the support of the Markov chain could be any subset, then couldn't it? Couldn't you just have an arbitrary metric? No, because you measure the distance in terms of the geometry on the graph. So. Uh, so, so, uh, but still, if you, it's a, if you have an arbitrary finite metric space, you can just put a path between each pair of vertices. It's a planar graph. Oh, it's planar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if you just considered some n by n grid, uh, and you did simple random walk, then no one is surprised by the fact that this holds. Okay. After, after t steps, your distance, you expect your distance to be about square root of t away from the starting point. Um, but suppose you, the random walk uh, didn't sit on the edges, so you could do things like make larger jumps. Okay. Then, if, actually, if, if all the jumps were the same length, then you also wouldn't be surprised, because kind of just by rescaling, it again would be a random walk in the plane, and the same thing with hold. So it starts to get a little more difficult if you think what happens when, you know, the, the, sometimes the jumps could be small, and then every once in a while there could be a huge jump. And how these, th now there's sort of, you can't kind of rescale to get a random walk sort of on the plane again. Or sort of a, or you, can't, you can't rescale to get a sort of a simple random walk. And this is already, I mean, there's a simpler proof of, there's a, there's a fairly easy proof that it holds for this graph, just because it's a subset of the, you know, it's, it's by Lipschitz to a subset of the plane, but already, this is, you know, it's, it's not so easy to analyze that from first principles if you have, when you have the jumps being allowed to vary in size. Okay, so that's one example to keep in mind. And uh, another example is uh, to, to look at the complete binary tree. So uh, if you weren't paying very careful attention to the definition, you might think that this is violated for the complete binary tree because if, if you start your random walk at the root, then simple random walk will, of course, go at linear speed. Uh, until, you know, for the height of the tree, okay? But the point is that this, this Markov chain is started at stationarity, and in the complete binary tree, almost all the stationary measure is at the leaves, at which point the random walk doesn't go anywhere, just sits at the leaves, right? So, uh, okay, so these are two examples to keep in mind. So now, first of all, let me tell you where this notion comes from, and then I'll, uh, in a little bit, get into the proof. So, uh, it goes back to this definition of something called Markov type uh, due to Keith Ball from 92. Uh, okay, so let me define what Markov type is. So a metric space, so this is a metric space, has Markov type P, so this is some number greater than or equal to 1. Um, if, okay, so there are a lot of quantifiers, but it's not so, okay, so here are the quantifiers. So, yeah, okay, so if there exists some constant C, uh, such that, uh, and I'll remove these quantifiers from most of the talk, so, but, uh, so, okay, so that for every finite state space, so this is some finite state space, for every uh, reversible Markov chain on this state space, okay, uh, start, started at stationarity, so, so. and for every time, we have this kind of dependence. Okay, now I have this map. Oh, I guess yes. Okay, for every, I'll explain this in a second. Okay, so take a finite state space, take a map from the state space into your metric space, take a reversible Markov chain on the state space. And then ask for something like this to hold. Okay, so it's the same thing I wrote before for planar graphs, except now I have uh, I've put a power p instead of the power p equals two. Um, and uh, here I had the, the the Markov chain walking around on the graph, whereas here it walks around on some auxiliary state space, and then there's a map from that state space into the graph. This is the right definition because, well, it's, I'll explain in a second, it's the one that has the correct applications. It also sort of composes very nicely. But for most of the talk, I'll actually omit this map F and just pretend that the random walk is, take, is, is walking around the metric space. Sort of, uh, I don't know of any, you know, I, it could actually be that if you, that you could remove them. Actually, I suspect it's probably not true for some trivial examples. but. So uh, for most of the talk, I'll omit the map f, but this is the proper definition. In other words, the, the Markov chain has more state than just where it is in the metric space. It also could have some auxiliary state sort of coming from this map. It's independent of metric space. Say it again? You see independent. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Oh, no, no, so, 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 so c, c could depend on the metric space. So 
but C cannot depend on any of this other data. Okay, so C is a probably, so the, whether a metric, you know, this P is the Markov type of the metric space, the best P for which this holds, and there's this constant also is a, a property of the metric space. And let me, okay, so where does this concept come from? First of all, I mean, it's a fairly natural, you know, way to talk about the drift behavior uh, sort of on finite subset of a metric space, okay? But um, it, it's inspired by uh, sort of uh, something in the, in the linear theory, so in the kind of the geometry of Banach spaces. So, okay, so suppose I have a norm space X, and then uh, I have a bunch of vectors in X, X1, 2, to Xn. Okay, so I, I could consider uh, a random sum that looks like this, where the epsilon i's are iid random signs. So I take, I take some norm space, take a bunch of vectors, and then randomly sum up the vectors with, with signs. And now, uh, okay, so I could, for instance, measure, you know, okay, let's just use the square for a moment. I, I could, for instance, measure, okay, so this is a kind of some kind of random walk in this linear space. I can measure the distance I go after sort of n steps according to this random walk. And I could compare it, say, to, uh, to something like this, okay? So this is, you know, where you can think about this as kind of, this is the length of, this is the sum of the lengths of the squares of the individual steps of the walk, okay? So uh, if a Banach space X satisfies this for some constant C independent of the choice of vectors and independent of the number N, the space is said to have type two, okay? And there's a sort of similar notion of, if you re reverse the inequality, uh, you get the notion of cotype. And it turns out that sort of this, these, this parameter sort of, uh, type and these parameters, type and cotype. I mean, if you, if you change the constant two to a, to a power p, then you get type p and cotype p. Uh, actually tell you a lot of geometric information about the, the Banach space you're in, okay? Um, so, okay, so let me give you an example, then I'll tell you why uh, Keith proved this. So for instance, uh, the following is known as the Mori extension theorem. Um, so take, take two Banach spaces, X and Y, and then consider the following type of question. Um, okay, and let's actually also fix some subspace of X. And then consider the following type of question. I have a, a bounded linear operator from S into Y. So it's a linear operator with bounded operator norm. And I'm, I'm curious about when I can actually get an extension of this operator to the whole space x, okay? Such that it remains bounded. So, so this one is bounded, and I want this one to be, to be bounded as well, okay? An extension, so it's an extension in the sense that if I restrict the new map to the subspace, then it's equal to the old map, okay? So you can ask sort of when do such extensions exist, and more it proved that such an extension always exists just given the behavior, sort of just given information about how random walks behave in X and Y. Uh, so if X has type two, okay, so if X satisfies an inequality like this, and Y has cotype two, then for any bounded linear operator, this extension always exists. And this, this kind of extension is a sort of a very powerful thing that you can, you, can, you can do a lot with. Uh, so what Keith was trying to do is, Actually, something on the face of it seems uh, kind of ridiculous is there's this uh, sort of beautiful history uh, in the nonlinear geometry of Banach spaces of linear notions. Okay, so this is, I mean, I said it in words, but so there's, this is a bunch of linear notions. I have linear spaces and subspaces and linear maps as having nonlinear analogs uh, <laughs> that sort of by all accounts one shouldn't expect to have except for the fact that we happen to live in a world that's nice enough that somehow this kind of thing works out. Uh, and so what, what Keith was trying to do was to give a, a nonlinear version of this extension theorem just in the category of metric spaces, okay? So, um, so what does these things mean in the category of metric spaces? Let's just, so suppose we have two metric spaces, X and Y, and now 
we'll have, and okay, so now we'll have this s, but now s is just a subset of x, so some subset of x. And instead of a, a bounded linear operator, we'll have a Lipschitz map from this subset into y. And now the extension question is whether this map extends, does there exist an extension of this map uh, to the whole of x, okay? which, is, which is Lipschitz. So for instance, it's a classical result that if x and y are Hilbert spaces, it's the result of Kirsch-Brown that uh, such an extension always exists. And in fact, you can take the Lipschitz constant of the extension to be equal to the original Lipschitz constant. Uh, here's, what, here's what Keith proved, that uh, if x has Markov type 2 um, and y has Okay, so Markov code type 2. Markov code type is not defined, but you can just, this is already interesting if y is just a Hilbert space. So, so this, this holds for y being a Hilbert space. So x has Markov type 2 and y is a Hilbert space or has Markov code type 2, which I'm not going to define for various reasons. Um, uh, then uh, this kind of Lipschitz extension uh, always exists. Okay. And I'm just trying to give this to, to get the setting correctly if you really sort of want to know what's going on. There always exists an extension such that the new Lipschitz constant is, is, is at most some constant times the old Lipschitz constant, and that constant depends on uh, just on this constant in the Markov type definition. So this, this point is it's a quantitative relationship as well. Okay? So this is, you know, sort of you go from looking at the geometry of spaces in, of linear spaces in, in terms of these linear random walks there's this metrical definition, and there's somehow this beautiful ex, you know, extension, uh, analog of the linear extension theory to the nonlinear setting. Okay. So, I mean, this is just sort of one example of the applications of this thing. Um, so, yeah. have an example that shows a metric space is not of mark of top two. Okay, good. So, let's talk about, so far I didn't, even, I didn't give any example of metric spaces that are mark of type two. So, <laughs> Uh, okay, so so what did Keith? So okay, yeah. So there was one problem with Keith's paper. It's a beautiful paper. Um, he he proved the following theorem. He proved that uh, Hilbert space, so L two, has Markov type two, and in fact with constant c equals one in the definition there. Um, I guess I should mention by the way that Markov type one is trivial. So if you take p equals one, then this follows with with constant one just by using the triangle inequality linearity of expectation. And then the fact that you're at stationarity means that every step of the walk is actually distributed the same as, you know, sort of fz0, fz1. Okay, so, so p equals 1 is trivial. Just follow from the triangle inequality. Um, right. Uh, so, so, okay, so the, <laughs> yeah, this theorem seems great. The only problem was that this was the only, that Hilbert space was the only space for which Keith was able to prove Markov type 2. So, if, there was, if this was really a nonlinear, sort of uh, a hardcore nonlinear uh, generalization of, of type and co-type, then you would expect that you know, there would be other spaces besides just Hilbert space that had this notion. Okay, so I'll come to, I'm coming to your question. Okay, so, um, so now let me mention sort of, so this was the situation until this work of, I've already all right, written your names elsewhere, so from now on this will be, MPSS. Um, right, so they proved two things. First of all, they proved that LP for P bigger than 2 has Markov type 2, uh, which, is, which is like a very comforting thing because those spaces have linear type 2. So if this was really a nonlinear generalization, then you would hope that when you restrict to the linear category, you sort of get the linear theory back. So, so that's great. And they also prove that trees have Markov type 2. And for, I guess for, especially for Yuval, it's a very nice kind of, so, th so this was in, in the, in this, in sort of in the functional analysis setting, this was kind of the most important open problem after Key's work to, uh, to, to resolve the Markov type of LP for P bigger than 2. Uh, I believe that they started actually just working on the problem for trees. 
And it turns out that actually trees are a bit harder in some sense than LPP bigger than two. So once they solved the tree problem, sort of this problem fell rather okay, immediately. Okay, so there are other spaces of Markov type two. What's an example of a space that doesn't have Markov type two? Okay, so, so L1, okay, I'll even say it a different. L1 uh, has only trivial Markov types, only, only Markov type one. It has nothing better than one. Okay, so why is that? So just just take the okay discrete hypercube sitting inside L1, and just take st standard random walk. So simple random walk on on the Hamming cube, right? And now it's 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 straightforward to see that uh, say the distance from your the starting point to your ending point after, say, n over three steps, this is, you know, this is at least n over 10 with high probability. Right. So this immediately shows you that this space has no non-trivial Markov type, because after n steps, it's gone distance n. So certainly it will not be the n. And of course, every, every step goes distance only one. So the right-hand side here is one. The left-hand side is after t steps, but for t equals n over 3 is going to be like n, it grows linearly. It doesn't grow at, you know, sort of any slower than that. Okay? So this shows that L1 has only trivial Markov type. Okay? And, and I guess it's a good point to sort of point out one other thing about Markov type now, um, which is, OK, so let me, let me do the following. Suppose x and y are metric spaces. Uh, let me just write down what it means to be people people know. But the sort of the map uh, map from x to y is by Lipschitz. Um, okay. Uh, right, if it preserves all pairwise distances, so all right. I'm going to cheat a very small amount here. Okay. So, so let, let's say this, uh, a map f is by Lipschitz if it preserves all the distances up to a factor of c. This, this quantity that we'll call the, bilip, the sort of the infimal c such as this holds, we'll call the by Lipschitz distortion of the mapping. And uh, one thing that's fairly apparent is that this Markov type is the by Lipschitz invariant, which means that if I have a metric space x that embeds into y by Lipschitz -ly, and y has Markov type 2, then x also has Markov type 2. Okay? And that's just because if you look at the definition, if I can change all these values up to constants, and the you know the statements is still true. Okay, as long as I change them up to universal constants, not depending on the chain. So if I can embed one space into another space, and the in the bi Lipschitz way, and the new space has Markov type p, then x inherits this from the new space. Okay, um, and in fact, in a quantitative way, right? So if if I could embed one space into another with distortion k, then uh, you would have the sort of same kind of inequality. Okay, I guess. All right. <laughs> okay. This doesn't matter because it's just a constant raising to the power p. But if I want the constant to change in proportion to the distortion, I guess I should put a power p here. Uh, but the point is, it's quantitative. So if, if the map has distortion d, then the new then then sort of x will inherit mark of the Markov type of y, but now with a constant so where this constant has grown by a factor of d. Okay. So in particular, you can conclude, for instance, from this argument that the Euclidean distortion, so the, the, the distortion required to by Lipschitz the embed the n-dimensional cube into Hilbert space uh, grows like square root of the dimension. Okay, so there are many ways to prove this. It's been known for over 50 years. But this, this gives you a, an example of how Markov type comes into play also when you think about the sort of by Lipschitz geometry of metric spaces. Okay, this is a very simple example, but by studying random walks, you can sort of really compare the geometry of two spaces using this kind of notion. OK, good. Uh, OK, so now let me return to the, the conjecture. So, so I'll, prove, I'll prove this to you now, um, well, in, in a moment. But different from Keith's proof, I'll, I'll follow sort of NPSS. And then you'll see why the second, sort of the subtitle of the talk comes into play, why 
why martingales become a key object of study here. Okay, so ask me any questions if you have any at the moment. All right. Okay. All right, so, okay, so now coming back to the planar graph question, why hasn't sort of the theory so far answered this question? Well, one reason is that we know that, plan that there are planar graph metrics which do not bi Lipschitz embed into Hilbert space. Uh, and, and they don't bi Lipschitz embed into LP for P bigger than 2. So you can't use any of this sort of embedding machinery we've talked about uh, to solve this question. Let me tell you one thing we do know about planar graphs. Obviously, we know a million things about planar graphs. So uh, let me tell you. Uh, sort of one kind of embedding we know they do have, and then I'll, I'll tell you our main result. So, okay, so one more notion of embedding, and then we'll move on to martingales. All right, so this is a notion of a threshold embedding. So, so we have, again, two metric spaces, x and y, and we'll say that x threshold embeds into y, uh, okay, so if there exists a constant k, and now this threshold embedding is going to be a collection of mappings, not a single mapping. So it's a family of mappings from x to y. Uh, the family is indexed by some non-negative real number. Okay, so it's a family uh, of one Lipschitz maps, which satisfy the following. Um, if the distance between x and y in x is at least tau, OK, well, if I had a single bi Lipschitz map and the distance was at least tau, then the distance in the image would be at least tau divided by some constant or times some constant. Uh, but here, the sort of only one of these maps is required to notice this. So, In this threshold embedding, okay, we have this kind of condition. These are all supposed to be tiles, even. Mm. All right. Okay. So x thresholds embeds into y. If there is this a family of one Lipschitz maps, basically one for every scale of the space. So there is no map. There is no global map that sort of can get all of the geometry right. But at scale tau, phi sub tau reflects the geometry at scale tau up to a constant. So if the distance, this is for all x and y in x. But if the distance in x is at least tau, the distance in y should be at least tau to a constant factor. And this k is, this k is a universal constant. Okay? So this may look a little bit strange. It's, there are plenty of examples. For instance, even the complete binary tree, uh, old result of Borgen shows that the complete binary tree does not embed into any Hilbert space, but it does threshold embed into Hilbert space. Uh, if you want to see, I can, I actually, I'll, I won't do it now, but if you want at the end or offline, I can, I found at least a, a fairly simple description of a threshold embedding of the complete binary tree into Hilbert space, if you want to see what one of these things looks like. Um, and actually, especially in, in the number of applications in computer science, understanding the relationship between these threshold embeddings and bi Lipschitz embeddings was very important, okay? So, you know, sort of there's this ongoing theme in, in, uh, many parts of metric geometry of understanding sort of when the ability to control a space at every scale uniformly it sort of implies the ability to control it somehow at the same, all at the same time, all the scales simultaneously. Okay, so this is the notion of a threshold embedding. And here's just, uh, I shouldn't call it a fact, it's not obvious, uh, a theorem uh, that sort of planar graph metrics threshold embed into Hilbert space. So you can take that, so I'll add the word uniformly, uh, so uniformly here means, so you can interpret this theorem in, in multiple ways. If you take an infinite planar graph metric, it, it threshold embeds in the Hilbert space. If you take a collection of finite planar graph metrics, they all threshold embed with the same constant k. The constant is uniform, it doesn't depend on the, okay? So, and I, I won't go into it now, but actually, along with this conjecture, uh, they asked about other spaces, like doubling spaces, uh, you know, other even things sort of like hyperbolic spaces, spaces of bounded Nagata dimension. Okay, that wasn't specifically asked there. But the point is that 
uh, all of those spaces admit threshold embeddings in the Hilbert space. Okay, so sort of, it's not just the planar graph question, although that's the one I'll focus on at the moment. Okay, so that's so this is one thing we know about planar graphs, and now here is the main here is the main theorem, which I'll try to present in the remaining time. Uh, if a metric space threshold embeds into Hilbert space, then this space inherits uh, Markov type 2. Okay, so for by Lipschitz embeddings, it's straightforward, but it turns out you actually need much weaker control on the geometry to get Markov type 2. Okay, so just the existence of a threshold embedding is enough to get Markov type 2. And for any sort of enthusiasts or junkies, you can, you know, you can sort of generalize as you say, if, if you threshold embed into a P uniformly smooth Bonnock space, then you have Markov type P. So there is sort of a, uh, a generalization beyond Hilbert space. But this is sort of the most interesting thing because it has applications. It shows that planar metrics and doubling metrics and sort of uh, hyperbolic spaces and so on, they all have Markov type 2. Okay. All right, so now I want to give you some idea of how this theorem is proved. And now, okay, so now we'll go to probability. All right. Wait. I thought it was clear that it was about to be true. <laughs> well, no, but I thought that was a very universal C. That was yeah, yeah, so this is, okay, uh, yes. So I guess this is something people do in the world quantitatively. In other words, the, the Markov type constant only depends on the constant in the threshold embedding. And so the fact that this is uniform it does imply that you get uniform constants. OK, you're, you're right. Um, so it's, it's weird if you, it actually does imply it just by itself. You can actually take all the planar graph metrics and just, and just put them all in one single giant planar metric space. You don't even care if it's separable or not. I mean, so you can just, and then, and then the fact that I just have it for a single graph means it holds with uniform constant. But, uh, OK. Uh, all right, so now uh, let's start with something easy. Let's see. Of, uh, let's see. I have 20 minutes. Is that how long I have? Um, oh, that's all. All right. Uh, okay, let's prove this fact that was first proved by Keith Ball, but we'll prove it in a more complicated way that the real line um, has Markov type 2. Okay, this is our goal. Uh, okay, so, so recall what happens. We have this we have this Markov chain, which is sort of has its state space is finally many points on the real line, and this thing hops around, and we want to prove uh, something like this with p equals two. Okay, so how can you do it? Well, there is one situation on the real line where we know we get some kind of behavior like this, and that's if we had a martingale, right? So Suppose that we have some, some real value martingale, then by just orthogonality of martingale different sequences, this, the, the expected distance squared after t steps is exactly the sum of the distances squared out in the individual steps, OK? So at least martingales satisfy, you know, the kind of growth that we're looking for. Okay, so this is not a martingale, but maybe it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's a, you start at stationarity, right? So, you know, if you run it for long enough, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just, you know, the, sort of the center of mass stays at the same point because you started at stationarity. Okay, so uh, the way to bring Martin Golds uh, into the fold here, and this is what uh, NPSS did, uh, based on some work of, uh, Lyons and Zhang, Zhang uh, TJ Lyons. Uh, okay, so, so let's try to convert this, this, this Markov chain into a martingale. Which Zhang was it? TS, Zhang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
okay, let's let's try to convert this chain into a martingale. So, all right. So uh, here's how. Okay, so the first step we can do pretty easily. All right, we'll start the martingale at, z at zero. Good. Uh, now we're the next step. We get into trouble. So let's let's sort of try to define the difference sequence. Okay, so so if, if the world was sort of as we might hope and expect, we would just define our martingale difference to be the differences of the values in the chain. You know, and that, you know, if this was a martingale, we'd be done. So we'd be really happy. Okay, because if it, you know, then this would this would hold. That would immediately give us our inequality. Of course, it's it's not. So okay, let's just add the appropriate correction term. Right? If, for this to be a martingale, we want that the conditional expectation of this is zero. So let's just force it to be zero. Okay? So the differences here are given by how, the, how our chain behaves minus the defect from, of our chain from being a martingale. Okay? Okay, so let me tell, there, there's, a good, there's good things and bad things. The good thing is that we can control by the way, tell me if I, I won't write any lower, but tell me if I start to write. The good thing is that we can control the increments of this martingale in terms of the increments of the chain. So this squared is at most sort of twice the expectation of this squared plus twice the expectation of this squared. So sort of, all right, I can write something like this. And then because we're at stationarity, this is four times z0 minus z1 squared, okay? So I've given, you some, I've given you a martingale. At least I can bound the differences in terms of the differences of, of z. So, all right. The problem, of course, is that uh, what I really want to be able to do now is say, well, if the martingale doesn't go very far after t steps, then the chain also didn't go very far after t steps. This is problematic because in every step, this martingale picks up this sort of extra cruft that's sort of from the non-martingaleness of z. So now here's the, the beautiful step. I mean, we have a reversible Markov chain at stationarity. So we've been a little bit sort of like, we've broken symmetry by, by only tracking it from the beginning, right? Because it should be the same run backwards in time. So in one sentence, I'll say the idea, and then, then we'll write it down. But the idea is now to do the same thing, but have another martingale that tracks the Markov chain backwards in time. And then, by the magic of reversibility, when we take the difference of those two martingales, all the crap will cancel out. And we'll, you know, sort of when they, you know, one is going forward in that time, one going backward in time, kind of when they meet, every, the, this extra stuff cancels out. Okay? So, uh, what do I mean? So here's, here's our backwards in time martingale. It's, it starts at time t, and then, the differences are given by t minus s minus 1. I'm just trans the transformation is just t minus this. OK. So the point is, here's another martingale with respect to the backwards filtration. Um, and, and, and it satisfies, the same argument gives sort of, it satisfies that its increments are bounded by the increments for, for z. And now here's the, okay, I'll state it as a, a lemma, but uh, if I look at zs plus 1 minus zs minus 1, this is exactly this minus, this should be plus 1. Okay, so this is my claim, that this is equal to this. No. No, good. Okay. Uh, uh, it's, it's not divided by two. Uh, no, check it. Oh, okay, let's, let's check it. Uh, so, so for m, what do we get? We can just plug it in. I mean, you know it's not divided by two. We get... This forward back for the mathematical. But you have a, the time index difference by two on the left. Yeah, so there's a gap of two on the left. That's the, right, so in the discrete case, there's a parity issue. So there's a, it's a different from continuous. Continuous, yes. one you have to divide by two, right? right. In the discrete case, it, uh, so discrete. It's, uh, it's actually a little uglier because you have this, this gap. But, okay, so you can just, but here's the, 
okay, we'll just do the calculation. So you get ZS plus 1 minus ZS minus expectation of this conditioned on this. And here you get, okay, so here we get ZS minus 1 minus ZS. So again, so you take T minus this and you get S minus 1. Uh, and you get minus expectation of this, okay? And now, okay, now we're subtracting this from this. So this cancels, okay? For here we get the right thing, ZS plus 1 minus ZS minus 1, okay? ZS cancels. And now we have reversibility. The expected value of ZS plus 1 conditions on ZS is exactly the same as the expected value of ZS minus 1 conditions on ZS. So those that cancels as well. Uh, okay, so the so sort of the the differences in z up to this annoying parity issue can be represented by not it's 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 not a single martingale but it's a, the difference of two martingale different sequences, uh, and so what this implies okay so there is a parity issue that I'm going to now gloss over because it's messy is that we can write z t minus z zero as a difference of two martingales, a t and b t, where these the increments here are are bounded, sort of the squares of the increments here are bounded by what they were in, in z. A and b are almost m and n, except for the fact that you have to correct for the you know you have to correct for the parity issue. Okay, so then this immediately tells us what that expected value z t minus z zero squared is at most well twice expected a t squared plus twice expected b t squared. But now these are martingales, and their different sequences are bounded by this. So immediately we get, OK, there's some constant times t. OK. All right. So there, we proved. So that's the end of the proof that the real line has Markov type 2. Okay? And it was, it was by taking our Markov chain, decomposing it into a difference of two martingales, and then using just a straightforward bounds for the martingales. Okay? So two things to observe. First of all, um, the proof didn't have to be on the real line. Actually, the, one of the beautiful things about the proof is that it only uses addition and multiple, uh, sorry, addition, it only uses addition and subtraction. Okay? Uh, it doesn't use multiplication at all. So even if it used multiplication, it would still work, it would still go from the real line to Hilbert spaces. But since it uses only addition and subtraction, Actually, you can generalize it to arbitrary norm spaces with the caveat. OK, so there's one part that this is the part of the proof that uses multiplication, actually. The idea that martingale different sequences are orthogonal, that actually involves inner products. So this is what fails in a general norm space. But everything else carries through. OK. Um, and actually, with, so with this machinery now, for instance, if you, if you can control martingale different sequences in LP spaces, then you can prove that LP has Markov type 2 for p bigger than 2, which is what uh, NPSS did. So now let me try to tell you the difficulty that arises in proving the main theorem here. Okay. All right. So we're going to follow this formula, but then we'll get stuck. OK, so if, if we have our space x and we said, suppose we had a Suppose we have a bi Lipschitz map from X into L2. I can kind of, you know, sort of, the point is that now I can, all right, and I also I have my, my Markov chain taking values in X. I can use this, okay, so you have to, again, you have to believe that everything I said here works if you replace R by Hilbert space. You know, just go through and check. You know, okay, it, it does work. Um, I mean, it's all, it's, you know, there's only, addition and then maybe like the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Uh, okay. So we can so we can we we'd sort of take our bi Lipschitz map, we would write the this as a as a difference of two Martingales in Hilbert space, and now just apply everything as before, and we would sort of conclude that okay, so what do we conclude? Expected value of this is at most um, 
some constant times t okay, times this. This is, a, this is all in Hilbert space. Right? This is the L2 norm. And now use the fact that it's by Lipschitz. On the right here, you just replace this by, you know, okay. What's going on in the metric space? And on the left here, I say the same thing. Replace it by what's going on in the metric space. There's a reason I'm doing this, you know. Okay. I've already claimed that by Lipschitz preserves the so the property. But so okay, so I mean here, so you would first map your space in the Hilbert space, you would write sort of the, the Markov chain under this map as a difference of martingales, and then proceed as before. The problem now is that we don't have a by Lipschitz embedding, we just have a threshold embedding. So we only have control, sort of for every scale, we have to use a different map which means that for every scale, we actually get a different martingale, right? So now, if my threshold embedding, I unfortunately, of course, erase the definition. I'll recall it in a second. But if I look at sort of my map for that, that's able to control scale tau, this is now, I'll sort of, I can again write this as the difference of two martingales, but the martingales depend the martingales depend on the scale of the mapping that I'm using. Okay, all right. So now let's try to use that to, to prove it, and then you'll see where the main difficulty lies, and I'll tell you how to resolve it, and then we'll be we'll be done. Okay. So if this didn't make sense, let's uh, just okay. Here's our setting. We have a metric space X. We have this Markov chain Z, and we have this family of mappings from X into Hilbert space. So these, these are all Lipschitz. And they have the property that if the distance in X is bigger than tau, then the distance in the Hilbert space is bigger than tau divided by some constant. Okay. And now let's try to use this to prove some bound on expected value of this. Okay. So this is what we care about. We're trying to prove that the existence of this bedding gives x Markov type 2. So we should be able to prove an upper bound on this thing. Okay. So now here's sort of, I'm just going to do kind of the most obvious thing. I want to control this, but I can only, you know, I can sort of only control one scale at a time. Okay. So let's first just write this. Um, in the following way. Let's sort of write out the expectation squared in terms of the tail. So now at least I know sort of I can write this in terms of the events that this thing is big. Okay, that's going to allow me to use my mapping at scale lambda to say something about uh, something in Hilbert space, right? So now I can just say this is at most probability. Okay, so now I'm working at scale lambda. And I have a k here. Okay, so here I've just used the property that uh, when this is big, it implies that this is big. Okay, or that when this is bigger than lambda, it implies this one's bigger than lambda over k. Okay, now I know that for every lambda, all right, I've used, I'm using lambda, so let's put lambda. For every lambda, I, I, I can, this is a mapping into Hilbert space, so I can write it as a difference of two martingales. For simplicity and the sake of time, let's just pretend I can write it as a single martingale. I just uh, cut down the number of terms by two. So let's just use A. So we can now bound this by probability that this martingale, okay, now it's indexed. Okay, good. This is where I want it to get. Okay, so now I sort of, I can bound it by this kind of weird thing. Now this is very strange because well, first of all, it's not even necessarily measurable, but ignore that for the moment. Uh, this is very strange because at every point in time, I'm considering a different martingale. Okay, so for, I mean, if these were just, you know, if these were arbitrary martingales or even martingales with just bounds on um, sort of their their total L2 norm or something, I would be out of luck here. The only real benefit I have now is that I know the way these martingales were constructed. They all live on the filtration that follows the random walk around the metric space. So they're all defined sort of with respect to the same filtration. Uh, and that brings us to the following 
I'll state a theorem now, uh, and then you'll see how this sort of, basically I have some kind of bound on the increments of all these Markov chains, but there's a bunch of them, and they could all use those increments in different ways. So this is where the part about Martingale's aiming comes into play, sort of, okay. So, yeah, so let me write down the, here's a theorem. Okay, so I have, um, and I'm just abstracting out what we know here. So we have some common filtration of our probability space, and we have some random variables, alpha t, which are adapted uh, to the filtration. And now, consider, say, a family of martingales. Let's index them. Okay, I'll index them by... Okay, some index at i. Okay, so this is some family of martingales, and what I'm going to say is that okay, and they all they, sorry, all the martingales are with respect to this filtration. Um, I can bound all of their different sequences uh, uniformly in terms of alpha. Okay, so I have a bunch of martingales, and what I know about them is they all sit on the same probability space and. I have this, this is, a, this is a random variable, but I have the same random upper bound on all their, dif on all their differences, okay? This random variable is the one coming from the random walk. This is essentially how far the random walk goes in the metric space. And that upper bound is how far all of these martingales can travel, okay? And now what I want to be able to say is the following. Okay, so this is the assumption. Then, uh, the integral, uh, okay, should I? Uh, all right, I'm going to use y instead of lambda. Because it's, okay, of this times the supremum over all these martingales, I'll take the worst possible tail, and let's okay. So here's what I want to say. I have this integral, which is it's the same integral here. I've just replaced lambda by y, just so that there's not Lambda here is tied to the martingale as well. Uh, here I've taken just the supreme over all these possible martingales. If I took the soup outside, then there would be an obvious bound here. If the soup was outside, then this is just, what's inside is just the expected square of this. That's what's inside if I take the soup outside. It's the soup of a bunch of, over a bunch of martingales, but the integral is just the expected square. And then, as before, we can just bound it by T is one, one, yes. Okay. So if I take the soup outside, then I have the bound that I can just bound. This is just the, the, the two norm of the martingale. It's just the expected value squared, and I can bound it by the expected values of the increments. Okay? So the novelty is that the supremum comes inside, but it's still true with some universal constant C out here. Okay, so this is, in some sense, at least for, here I've done it for real valued martingales. This is maybe the main, technical step to analyze martingales in the real case. And, okay, so I, I just wanted to sort of express the difficulty of what's going on here. Again, if you get rid of the soup and you had a single martingale, then this would follow immediately from, this is just the expectation squared, and you get it immediately from the fact that the expectation squared is at most of some of the differences squared. But if I allow you to take the soup, it's not clear at all sort of why these martingales can't sort of each one try to aim for a different point in the tail, right? Like, uh, suppose I even only have two jumps, you know. I have a big jump I take with some small probability and a little jump that I take most of the time. So, so okay, so now my martingales can, at every step, I have a whole family. They can, do, they can take either of these two jumps. So I can consider, for instance, the martingale that always takes the small jump to the right and the big jump to the left. Or I can consider a martingale that picks uniformly at random and sometimes takes a small jump to the left and sometimes to the right. Or the martingale that, you know, goes the other way. Right. And the question is whether, sort of, if I give you some tail, some tail bound y to aim for, can you, can you sort of conspire so that your martingale manages to sort of use all its L2 norm just to hit that particular value of y? Okay? So, well, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, so, sort of, there is uniform control even if you take the soup over all these things. Okay? So this was the sort of how well can martingales aim. Not that well. Okay, so like they can't, they, a martingale can't conspire 
to use its, all of its two norm to sort of just manage to get to y, okay? I mean, they're subject to the same difference constraints. All right, so this is the main theorem. What's the proof? Well, uh, it's essentially due to work of, of Burkholder and Gundy from the 70s, um, although that took us quite a while to realize. Uh, so if you don't, I mean, they have some very beautiful techniques for analyzing martingales using very clever stopping times that allow you to prove this kind of uh, result. Okay, so let me know if it's not clear. I'm gonna end in just a second, okay? But this is the main kind of thing that comes up here when you have these threshold embeddings. Now for every scale, there's different martingale, and you have to somehow control them all uniformly. And it, it works, but it's, you know, it's perhaps counterintuitive, yeah. You don't state the burglar gun equality of use because it's not the standard one. So it's not the, st okay, so, right. It's, it's odd, actually. It doesn't appear in uh, his book. It does appear in a survey paper, in like around section 11. Okay, what's the... Um, okay, so here I'll, I'll state the... The theorem? All right, so let's see. So I have a, a martingale, and I want to make sure. And um, in, that, in this case, I need some lower bound on uh, like this, OK? You need some lower bound on uh, you know, some kind of thing that says you make a move often enough. Okay? Um, so this is a real valued martingale. I have some bound like this. And then let's define the square function just to be the sum of the squares of the increments. Okay, so this is sort of what I know about the martingale. And now here's the claim. Um, all right, so let me, let me write it down. Uh, I guess I should do this. Uh, okay, so I'll write it down and then I'll say what it, what it says. Okay, so for any sufficiently smooth function, one has following kind of control. Okay, so this is the maximal process associated with the martingale. So I have a martingale, I look, at its, I look at its maximum value, so I'll say what smooth means in a second, but for any sufficiently smooth function, the maximum value, the, the phi of this maximum value is controlled in terms of phi of the square function. Okay, it's kind of a very strong inequality, and what kind of functions can you use? So this holds um, as long as Sort of phi is doubling in the sense that, I guess, when I okay, so there's quanti there's quantitative argument here. You assume phi is doubling with some constant lambda. So when I double the argument, the the value goes up by a factor of lambda. That gives me some constant c lambda such that this holds. Okay, uh, and the interesting thing is, I mean, you can't use this to bound the tail necessarily because you can't use cutoff functions. But if you if you look at this integral. You don't really need to be able to bound the tail precisely. You only need to be able to bound it up to something which is sort of up to third order because it's sort of a, the integral is computing something of second order. So, so just by making phi drop off cubically, that's enough to, right, which is going to be doubling. So if a phi is just a cubic function, you'll get something doubling. That's enough to control this integral. Okay. This is the Burkholder Gundy theorem. It, it's, uh, it's beautiful, and it somehow has to sort of cope with this, and uh, it does it using 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 magic. So, I mean, it's it's sort of like uh, right. Well, Burkholder is like you know has a survey where he has all these techniques, and there's sort of this you know, it's a really magical stopping time argument that gets this to hold. Okay, uh, so I, I have to end now. 
So I just, but I, I did want to sort of give one open question. So, okay, so this was a question about whether or not martingales can sort of aim, you know, use even subject to some bounds, kind of aim to be at a particular point. Let me just say, tell, state another question that came up in some other work with Yuval, uh, which is also about how well martingales can aim. And in this case, better than we would have liked. Uh, so, so it's just as sort of like as a, you know, uh, as a way to see the deep richness of even very simple martingales. Here's a, consider the following class of martingales. So I have a martingale on the real line, and the martingale can just do the following. Uh, at every point, so actually, it's, it's, suppose it's a, it's a martingale on the integers. At every point, uh, it can go plus or minus one, or it can go plus or minus two. These are the options that the martingale has to itself. Okay? It's very, you know, it can just go left or right, or it can go left two steps and go right two steps. Okay? And it's, you can even assume it has the, it's, it's sort of Markovian. So it doesn't, it just makes a decision based on the integer it's at. Okay? So every integer it goes plus minus one or plus minus two. And now you can ask, um, so it's a whole family of martingale. So you can, you can choose the rule however you want. Suppose you try to choose the rule, uh, to sort of so that you land at zero as often as possible. Okay, you always have to move, so you can't just sort of stay still. You have to stay moving. But you choose the rule so that you want to maximize the probability of being at zero. Okay? So uh, does anybody have a, a guess on what the upper bound should be? Sort of now, I want to say that no matter what rule you choose, again, your rule is just at every point, and you can choose differently at every point, but you can go plus minus one or plus minus two. That's all you can do. Okay? And now I want to give you an upper I want to give an upper bound on how well you can hit zero. So how well your martingale can aim for zero? Does anybody have a guess? One half. One half? Uh, well, that's definitely a good upper bound, one half. <laughs> but no, 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 so. Well, <laughs> you're, you're talking about a fixed end, right? For, for a fixed end, but, I, but, 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 you can, but it's an asymptotic problem. So I don't, if up to a constant, I'm happy with. Yeah, but but, you're, but you're, you know what end you're trying to optimize. You do know what end you're trying to optimize for. Yes. So, uh, okay. So, so, so Kostya said this is sort of the obvious conjecture to have. Uh, and in fact, I, I mean, you've all lived with this belief at least for probably for six months that this should be the right answer. That, that I mean, this thing, look, it's plus minus one or plus minus two. I mean, sort of, it can't, I mean, the best you can do is something like this. Now, the truth is we actually don't know what the answer is. Um, but there is reason to suspect that actually the right answer is that you can, one can achieve something like uh, something significantly better, n to the half minus epsilon. So there is some rule which does much, much better than standard random walk. OK, so computer simulations have borne this out. And there is a, there is a differential equation which, suge which suggests this happens at What's that? The epsilon was big. <laughs> I know, it's, it's like, yeah, it's not like a little epsilon. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's you know, I mean, no, epsilon comes in various sizes, right? But I mean, <laughs> no, no, you get, there, and there is a, I mean, there is a, there is a differential equation which suggests, yeah. The rule, what is it? Oh, that I don't know. I, I can draw a picture of the rule for you, which is just that as long as you're within a certain area, you just do plus minus one because you're trying to stay near the origin. And then, once you realize you're getting screwed and you've somehow sort of like gone way further than you want to be, you just desperately start plus minus twoing to try to get back to the origin. So, so if, if there's k units of time left and you're closer than root k, then you walk plus minus one. If you're farther than root k, you walk plus minus two. And, and actually, we can prove this for variance of this. Instead of plus minus one, plus minus two, you do, you stay at zero with some high probability and you walk plus minus one. Then this, this can be proved. Uh, well, I mean, if you stay at zero with high probability, I mean, it's. No, <laughs> you stay, you, every step, you stay in place with probability 0.9 and you walk plus minus one. You do not approve it with equal zero or just. Yeah, yeah, and with the power? Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, this is with offer the thing in all the whatever. So brand new, but not for this plus minus one plus minus two. So there is a there is a differential equation that sort of Charles Smart uh, 
sort of analyze, which is able to, but it's not sort of the, the corresponds between the continuous and discrete case aren't able to touch events that are this fine, the fine as sort of being at zero. So, uh, so I, I, well, now I guess we should ask Yuval about his proof. So let me stop the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Is it, a, is it a combinatorial type argument or like, I mean, you just analyze, you have an exact rule and you do it by hand. Okay, good. Any questions or comments? There is a conjecture for the, what the best power is, is there though? Based on the differential equation. In the, yeah. So somehow the differential equation is the best thing for the continuum, is it? Or, or is it just a bound? Even there, it's even even there when you analyze it with two different rates, the power doesn't come out very cleanly. Uh, well, actually, Jeffrey found some old papers of Joe McNamara that indicate that for the continuous case, one could get like that. What's the power? Be the star. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So then, 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 for, for, for some power, this is bound. No, 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 no. So, yeah, well, as, as far as I know, and even what you've all said, for this, it, the, the best known, uh, the, you can, okay, there's a question whether you can prove an upper bound of some power that's, that's bigger. Uh, that is that, possible. That is easier. Uh, but I guess uh, you're saying, do you know a lower bound that beats this? That's what you really want. Can do you know any? Do, are you asking if we know any strategy that beats this one? No, no, no. I'm asking what. Um, so, so you're saying that the continuous case is better than the continuous case. Yeah. 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 No. no. Oh, okay. So you can't. Yeah, well, what I'm saying, do you know some, uh, you know, do you know the, the, the uh, uh, low bound on the, on the alpha? On the, on the power of the. Something yeah, that's like the yeah. power bound. No, that's like, I mean, if you always take one, it's a power of What? What's a power of No, but, but the, the question is an upper bound on the probability, not on the. So what's the upper bound? So the upper bound probability. So there is an upper bound which is you know one over <laughs> one over n to the point to the point one. Okay. Oh, okay. So that. So so. So you're trying to do that. What? So this is the case where you're trying to do. You're trying. The most interesting thing is to prove a lower bound on this, which shows that the upper bound cannot be one over root n, right. which they can do apparently for a slightly different model. But the point is that martingales somehow, even though they seem very trivial, I mean, like this one is almost like somehow there's still very sophisticated behavior. So this one comment that Tim said about you know Burple the Gluttony inequalities, many people were all used to seeing them where phi is a power, so like you bound the power of a martingale by a power of the square function, and that doesn't need the specific condition in the second line. Uh, but somehow, for this for this application, it was important to have files that are more general than just power laws. And, and this is you know, delayed us for a long time. We were so used to virtual the Gandhi or BDG just for our power laws, and that was not good enough. And and I guess yeah, this condition doesn't necessarily hold for our martingales, but uh, you know, sort of. So, so what we do is we actually just you know give the martingale a little kick in, in case it doesn't satisfy this, and then that can be absorbed in the square function. Wow. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so we adjourn, and I remind you...